Well, good afternoon, Diane. I hope Hi. you're doing well. I am. It's so good to see you in person, Joe. Well, I'm glad to see you, uh, at least, you know, through the magic of modern technology. Uh, how are you keeping yourself busy? How are you keeping yourself sane during the lockdown? Hmm. <laughs> Everybody has that question and we all ask it of each other, it seems like. Um, well, I, I have discovered uh, that saying one day at a time because boy, it sure seems to be true uh, right now. I, I'm not, uh, it's like a whole universe or a whole year each day or a whole, I mean, one rotation of the earth really seems to mean something now, whereas before it was, uh, a general concept now. I really enjoy each day much more completely. Um, you know, I have higher highs and lower lows, but I think that's because at the moment I'm unemployed and as an actor, <laughs> I'm always looking for drama. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Oh gosh. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's an inside job. Uh, sanity right now. Oh yes, oh and we, yes. And we need and we need a village. So it's good to see you and talk with people any way I can. Well, now um, your upcoming film. It was originally set to open in August, but uh, it's now uh, going to open in November, uh, which is usually a good sign. That means you know near the end of the year they're thinking <clears throat> awards buzz. I see. Uh, yeah, right. So, so, t so tell yourself that. Uh, the film is called Let Him Go, and you're co starring with uh, Pa Kent again, uh, <laughs> Kevin Costner. Right. Um, how would you describe the film if one of your best friends came up to you? Oh, uh, what are you doing lately? What, what, what's your next film about? Hmm. Well, I'll. I'll uh... I have a disclaimer of saying, if you want your film not to get made, have me pitch it. <laughs> uh, because I, that's not my wheelhouse. Uh, I, I go into the minutia and, and I don't want to be any spoiler alerts. But, you know, I guess it is kind of a thriller in the sense that there's a suspenseful story unfolding of we're trying to get our grandson back. Mm -hmm. And, and the, there are many reasons for that. And it's a, uh, it's a family story. So I'm glad they put that in the tagline of the poster because that is true. It's nice to have, you know, honesty in advertising. And, um, and there's a lot of heart in it because there is the loss of, of our son and dealing with that level of intensity of loss and the grief that it brings, um, different people manifest their grief in different ways. And when you're in a long-term relationship, like a 30 something year marriage, <laughs> um, you know, we're, I think my husband in the story is struggling to, um, to bring me my character peace about it. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's a former lawman. So he's correct. Com usually used to taking charge of situations. He's yeah, most... well, he's retired and, yeah, and, and, right. and enjoying that in theory. I mean, that was the plan. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose at this point, our predicament is causing me to encourage him to use his access to uh, law enforcement and help us get... Uh, what I feel is the right thing done. And, uh, you know, my character is uh, a little on the pushy side and I, I, I love her for it. Um, but at the same time, it can be, it, I can be putting my husband in a, you know, a predicament that, well, I don't know, you know, he, he, he's, he's got to finesse a lot of things in order to, to, to make me happy and, and also mm -hmm. accomplish what I'm asking for, which might be impossible. Now, one of the, the many things I, I enjoyed about the film, I, I admired about the film is, I really got the impression this was a couple that had been together for a long time. They had private jokes. They had uh, references they made to maybe 
not so happy times in the past. There's right. one scene, and I don't want to make too much of it, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but uh, you're out looking, you know, for your your grandson, right. and he decides he needs a drink. So he goes into a, a liquor store, <clears throat> and he comes out, and he says, yeah, but now I don't need any nagging about this, more or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can take that any number of ways, and and the way you sort of finesse it, you know, it's like, okay, this is not the first time they've had this conversation. Right, right. Well, we, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. When, in some ways, when you've been together that long, you don't have, you can finish each other's sentences and you know what they're thinking. And, and uh, I think the line was, uh, you know, glad to not get a lecture or something like that. And, and, and so he was letting her know that he, he, all bets are off. If we're going to be out here doing what you're asking me to do, then maybe I'm coming out of retirement with that too. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I don't know. I don't know. It definitely is an allusion to, um, to, to a history that the, that the couple has, um, been through and you know honest to god long-term couples go through a lot and people change and people grow and for better or for worse or whatever judgments but all i'm saying is um that yes you're right it does it does bring up the fact that there is a there there in mm -hmm. their in their past that they shared because mm -hmm. there you <laughs> yeah because when we meet them, I mean, it's after he's retired, you're, you're raising horses on this ranch and you're there with your son and your son's wife and your, your recently birthed uh, grandson. Right. There's a tragedy, the, the son dies. And then the daughter who's, there's always been a hint of an estrangement. See, that's another thing, you know, without hitting the audience over the head with it you always got the feeling there was a certain tension between your character and, and the daughter-in-law. Oh, yes. And, and then she, a couple of years later, up and marries somebody, and then they go off with your grandson. And it's like, that's right. okay. And that's about she takes, all. She takes, my, she takes our blood and leaves. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, this, this grandchild is our one progeny. Yes, yes. And it's really interesting, once again, going to the dynamic of the situation, uh, you know, there, there is uh, Kevin's character thinking, mm -hmm. well, you know, life is full of goodbyes. You know, you, you can't really, and she's not going to settle for that. She's got her mama grizzly instincts going there. And I, I, I wonder, what, what can you draw upon as an actor? to come up with that tenacity or is that just a natural thing for you? I mean, you, when you decide you're going to go after something, you're going to go after it or? Well, knowing what the right thing is in a situation can be problematic because you want to make something happen that you feel is the right thing. And sometimes that's, you know, I don't playing God or whatever. And, and, and it's almost impossible for her to resist. And I understand that because I mean, that's such a God forbid scenario that to, to try to envision that you're living under it, which of course is what actors are asked to do all the time. <clears throat> so I didn't feel like I had to defend my character at all in terms of no. her, of, of, of her, um, will of steel underneath everything that she may be acting as though it's a request, but it's actually not really a request. More of a demand. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Which yeah. she even indicates at one point, okay, if you're not going to come along with me, fine. I'm going to go out there looking. Right. You're and, reminding me because it's been a while now since yeah, we yeah. filmed it. So yes, that's true. And, and it's, I don't want to say she shames him into it, but it's almost like, you know, again, the idea you've had this long-term relationship, he knows you're not going to let this go. That's true. That's true. And, and, and I, I, I really enjoy the, the simplicity in how that's communicated um, because 
Tom Bazooka did such a wonderful job of bringing the book to the screen. And, That's uh, uh, the, the writer director. Our, uh, our writer director, wonderful Tom, writer director. Tom, Tom Bazooka. Yeah. It's pronounced bazooka, but it's not spelled bazooka. It's yeah. funny. I mean, yeah. I know what you mean. The first time I, I actually asked somebody, now, how do I pronounce this? I said, okay, yeah, now how do you pronounce it? You know. My uh, favorite bubble gum when I was growing up. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. With the little comics inside. You right, know. right. <laughs> I always wanted to collect enough to send off and get a t-shirt. I never did it. I know, I know. I, I think my, I, I may still have a bunch in the drawer somewhere around here. It's a, but, okay, how does a director earn your trust because you have some really i can't think of another word for it, risky scenes in this film i don't mean physical risk so there's some you know in there right but the idea you go to some emotional extremes right and as as an actor i can't help but thank you okay am i doing too much here am i gonna right. look like a, a fool i mean i i gotta know that the director's there with the net to catch me if I right. fall off the tightrope. How right. does a director earn your trust? Hmm. Well, trust is its own word. I mean, it's implicit in my craft. Um, that's one reason why they say, I think I, I get this phrase right, but theater is an actor's domain and film is a director's domain because when you're live with an audience on stage, you have the final say. Uh, in, in, in film acting, of course, I suppose it's the editor that has the final say. And sometimes it's through a democracy of now they, they, they test screen and all of this sort of thing, I suppose. And, you know, I'm just sort of like, ah, bah, bah, bah. I don't want, I, I'm just grateful when it turns out to, to be what I imagined when I, what I imagined when I read it, because I fall in love with things in my mind's eye. So it's really about communication. And what's interesting, Joe, it's a great question you asked and you asked it in the magazine and, and I, I did get the, I got the magazine today and I got to read the interview. So I was so happy I got to know how much has already been gone over in, in the article. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Tom is such an excellent communicator and that is not always the case with film directors. Sorry to say, or, or they can be great social communicators but they're actually holding their cards very close to their chest in terms of, I don't know, almost manipulating a performance rather than cooperating with you in terms of the end result. Um, so it was, it was not the latter, it was very much the former. And um, we had a common goal and we were a team of, of many achieving that. And certainly the three or maybe even the four because of our wonderful DP. And, and you know, he, 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 I, loved, I loved the film he did with Sarah Jessica Parker so much. Um, the Family was, Stone. Yes, Family yeah, Stone. Yeah. When, if that's on TV, that's it. I can't change the channel. I'm watching the rest of it. It's just, mm -hmm. feel, I, I love it more every time I see it, which I don't say about many films. Uh, at, 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 that film ta taught me that he knows how to capture nuance in a in a group and i don't you know you could say oh somebody gets lucky they had a great editor or something but no after i met with him about the role i knew i wanted this role i loved i just loved this woman's um struggle and her inner you know the the inner world versus the outer world is 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 so he he was very much discussing with me her inner life rather than necessarily, you know, the, the end result performance. So he trusted that I was going to be the right actor to bring the inner life to the outer behavior, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. so it was a collaboration. Okay, well, one last question for me, and then I'd like to bring in some questions from our readers. Sure, yeah. Okay, now, uh, you made your movie debut a uh, little film called A Little Romance, and yeah. you were acting opposite Laurence Olivier. And then very early on, I, th I think it was your third film, uh, Catalani and Little Britches. Oh, with, gosh, yes, yes. There's some photos of that with Amanda Plummer and such Bert a great Lancaster. 1979. That was yeah. 13 years before this magazine got published mm -hmm. ever for the first time. So, so Burt Lancaster and Rod Steiger mm -hmm. and Scott Glenn. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of jumped 
into the deep end of the pool pretty early on in your career. John Savage uh, was in that film. Yeah, we had yes. an amazing cast, actually. Uh, I can only imagine that, you know, you must have been a little bit intimidated by these people. But uh, Yeah, well, I was yeah. definitely a kid, kid, kid. Yeah. But as your careers progressed, have you ever felt like, okay, now here's some child actor, some newcomer who's acting opposite me. Are they going to be intimidated by me? How can I put them at ease? Sure. Yes. 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 I remember very much in my first film, Laurence Olivier was very gracious and came to work with the, the young boy. He was 14 and I was 13 and his name is Thelonious Bernard. If you never know what happened to him, we, people come up to me and ask me, where is that young boy from a little romance? Why didn't he continue on and have a, a long career like I did? But on the Western, that was it's so intense. I call it the Western because I had never done one before. And it was, it's a distinct genre of film. And uh, to, to be a New York City kid chewing bazooka and, and <laughs> playing handball in the streets, I mean, skateboarding. So what, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a long distance between myself and that character. And it was the first time that I had portrayed a woman or a female, obviously, but you know, like a, a, from another era. And, and the, the plight of females, <laughs> historically, there's a lot to forget, which is interesting because we have to unlearn all the wonderful liberties that we have now mm -hmm. that we didn't historically. And what it meant to be a, a, a girl in that era uh, yeah, I just, I just loved that story. And the fact that it's a true story, the Catalanian Little Britches is the film you're speaking of mm -hmm. uh, from 1979. I, I know it's deeply archival, but honest to goodness, that is a feel good movie. And that is the one film where I, I don't know, we, we were filming on the John Wayne ranch in Durango, Mexico. John Wayne was still alive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, this place is vast and they filmed a lot of Westerns there. But I did get to go as the saying is, balls to the wall. I mean, I just went on that horse. We all went riding and they had a car under the camera following us. And you get to see me running on that horse. And I was like, well, if I'm gonna die, what a way to go. Uh, <laughs> I was just, we could, Ooh. anything could happen. And, and in 1979, I don't know if the rules were different or we just got away with stuff or I don't know, but it was fantastic. It was. It was one of the highlights of my life and, yeah. and a great time. And I learned a lot by watching that movie in terms of stuff I didn't know as an actor. And I'm mortified that at 14 years old, I just didn't know stuff. And, um, and it's on film forever with Burt Lancaster. And <laughs> it's just kind of cringe. One time I got lost on the horse at lunch. So that's a whole story I'll say for <laughs> a book. Well, now I want to ask you a question. Uh, Anne from Facebook, you've lived and worked in the American West throughout your life. What are some of your favorite places and cities to visit there and why? Oh, wow. Well, the short answer is I fell in love with Santa Fe and moved there and bought a home and lived there for six years as a second home. Um, right when I filmed Lonesome Dove, I just fell in love with the place. I mean, their license plates in New Mexico say the land of enchantment and I'm being driven to work every day at dawn and, and, and home every day at dusk because not a lot of night shooting and it's hard to do in Westerns, you don't, you know, mm -hmm. day for night. But um, out, out, out in, to be out in the environment is so informing to per performing, uh, to be where it's really happening. And you have to drive so far out into you know, back in 1979, we didn't have all the jet trails in the sky. And now I think, gosh, they have to CGI the sky because, mm -hmm. or telephone poles or whatever they didn't have back in the 1800s and such. Um, I think I'm digressing. So Santa Fe, oh. I loved and, and lived there because I fell in love with the sky. The sky is just, is amazing. And, and that was an exercise in learning about second home ownership and what a racket that is. <laughs> I feel like I'm not a sucker for that anymore because 
it's really a lot of work and quite a, an mm. expenditure and a luxury. And if you ever go anywhere besides your second home, mm -hmm. you feel guilty. Like you've spent all this money, you should be there. So why <laughs> you anywhere else? It's a funny thing, you know, but that was a while ago. I was still in my twenties. Yeah. Well, it's not that long ago. No. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. I'll take it. There you go. <laughs> okay. Jane from the uh, Cowboys and Indians website. Uh, where are some places around the world that you've most loved working and making films? I've been so lucky to work in Europe a lot. I mean, my first film was in Paris and, <laughs> and, and, and all around, uh, we were in Italy and Verona and, and, and you know, to play a runaway uh, was, was fun, but to do it European style was extra fun. And I did a road trip picture through the South of France uh, recently with uh, Eleanor Coppola directed it. Mm -hmm. And that was good times. Great COVID movie, because you can just sit there and eat the cheese and taste the wine with me. <laughs> I want to watch that movie and just relive it. But anyway, uh, so, you know, a lot of European places were great. I, I had the luxury of luxury, the amazing experience of being a child actor in the theater company, traveling really exotic locales in the early 70s as a I was missing my front teeth I was so young so I, I've been to places like Lebanon and Iran and I remember being at 10 years old and going uh, we were in Yugoslavia and I said on the phone to my mom it's a red country <laughs> I didn't even know what that meant but I <laughs> I was trying to learn, you know, different cultures. It was amazing. They would herd llamas down the street and we would work in the ruins, the ruins of these amazing countries in Greece and the ruins of Persepolis, uh, the ruins of Baalbek, if they're still there in, uh, in, in, in Lebanon. So it, yeah, Shiraz and Tehran. And I just, I kind of peaked at 10 years old, Joe, honestly, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of exotic travels, you know, but I did get to work on a, uh, documentary film called Half the Sky with um, just an amazing film. And that took me to Somaliland uh, in uh, Eastern Africa. And so I went to Mauritius on a film recently with, yeah, that was just, so it's the best when you get to, to travel for work and also you get to rehearse living in different houses and learn what you like and don't like and it's fun. Okay, question uh, from Sherry from Facebook. You've worked with so many great actors in your movies, but are there any you've yet to work with but would love to have the chance to work with? That is such a long list. That is a list that I would, I would wish to be able to access my Screen Actors Guild website and look at the whole list and just spend the next 20 minutes reading them off to you because there's so many talented, amazing people. I mean, you know, Mahershala Ali is just a force. Paul Dano is gorgeous. I miss, I mean, you know, the, I'm talking about the craft, obviously. I mean, beautiful souls. And um, golly, uh, it's, it's hard to name one person because you think of, you know, so many that I'm greedy to work with. Uh, and I've been so blessed, you know, to, to have a, a long list of partners. I got to work with Jessica Lange. I mean, Angelica Houston and Lonesome Dove. It was just one of those things. I say pinch me a lot, but I'll say it again there because she, she directed a formidable movie. Uh, people forget that. It's a wonderful time to revisit the work of, of, of artists from days of yore, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right now in, in COVID and when we're all sequestered up. I, it's interesting because I know we're parsing out things that have already been filmed and trying to figure out how to get them into theaters and mm -hmm. things wind up streaming or what have you. But there is so much available to remind ourselves how, oh, yes. how great we had it with all of the amount of things that have already been put on film, great work of people. By the way, you were talking before about when you do a Western, you have to forget about your modern mindset and, mm, you know. A lot to forget. But you and Angelica Houston in Lonesome Dove were pretty feisty for your time. Well, yeah, certainly Catalani and Little Britches. We joined the Doolin Dalton gang and yeah. helped rob yeah. banks and all of that. But yes, 
I think you had to make a choice in the other eras of, of are you going to lean forward or lean back? You know, mm -hmm. Personality wise uh, as a woman. Fairfield from Instagram. Uh, have you developed an appreciation for outdoor shoots and working in the elements? Or is it always more challenging than rewarding? There's only one thing that always irked me about working in the great outdoors, and that is generators. <laughs> you have to have power. Mm -hmm, you have to mm -hmm. have power. Mm -hmm. And the generators are either, they're, they're noisy and they make a lot of bad smells and it's just, you know, base camp and certainly, you know, where they're cooking the food to feed everybody. At the, at the, so the reality of going camping all together to create this fantasy story that's ca captured on film is one thing, but our experience doing it is another. So it's a world within a world. Um, you know, it's funny because at one point I drove a car on uh, vegetable oil. I would literally back in the 90s, well, maybe it was the, the aughts, mm -hmm. back when Bush was president, I, I went out and I would dumpster dive for oil. <laughs> and my, no, but here's a funny fact. Diesel cars and diesel generators, diesel engines run just as well on many different sorts of uh, fuel. Mm -hmm. And my car did better on non-pet, non-petroleum fuel. So I keep thinking we should get these generators to just use the, the gently used cooking oils. <laughs> Put some Mazzola, Mazzola oil in there. French fry smell. You can <laughs> recycle the oil and make no, uh, much less carbon. And yeah, anyway, I don't know, I digress. But the, the okay. diesel engines get to me. <laughs> okay, we've, we've only got a few more minutes. Uh, I want to ask you now, this is, as I say, it's not the, the first time you've worked with Kevin Costner, but you know, the, the, the previous times you were, you know, raising a superhuman uh, youngster. Mm -hmm. uh, how much time did you get to rehearse on this film? And what does he give you as an actor to work with, to play off against? Wow. Well, Kevin, Kevin has high standards. And I love that about him. Um, he's, he's seen it all, done it all, and he's directed formidably, as we mm -hmm. all know. Uh, so he's the knower. And, and you know, he must, I really felt, and, and so did Tom. We wanted Kevin to be pleased, you know, with, with the outcome. He's an executive producer on this. And, and uh, so, Rehearsing was a, a, an important, a, a very important thing that he respected as necessary to the process. And, I, and it's rare, sadly, it's rare. I find that the larger the budget of a film, the less, the, 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 the focus gets shifted to other things. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that better, but I mean, I, I saw some photographs of us on a hill way out, filming in Calgary and, and you see our little troop of people out there with all our equipment in this vast, <laughs> you know, uh, countryside, if you will. And, um, and you, and you realize that it is such a team sport. And, and I think that the department of actors or talent or whatever they call them on the call sheet, you know, um, when I come to work, I have, I get to remind myself that I am a department. I don't, I don't get, I'm not, it's not solo. I, I grew up in theater and I learned the team sport of presenting a story united, telling it beginning to end, which is a treat as an actor because you get to go on the journey with the audience that's having the journey versus mm -hmm. doing this patchwork experience of like a quilt. You're making one little piece at a time and it'll be put together later and they'll add music and strange things that you didn't realize or they'll rearrange the scenes and you would have done it differently had you known. But rehearsing is a, is a, is a, is a big part of connecting in your, in your uh, I don't know, heart chakra or your viscera or something that you can feel with another actor so that you at least know what is true for you. So you feel like you're passing a lie detector test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than hoping that the other person is 
in the saddle with you, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, you've touched, you've touched it in rehearsal, not too much, but you've touched it so it feels true and you know what to swim for when you're on camera together, really doing it. Well, uh, you will not be surprised to hear that uh, Kevin speaks very highly of you too. Uh, and he uh, is quoted saying very nice things about you and your craft in the uh, Cowboys and Indians story, a uh, feature story about you and Kevin and uh, Let Him Go, which will be available on the Cowboys and Indians website, uh, I think in another hour or so. So uh, Amazing, okay. Yeah. So it's so, gonna so of course, we'd prefer you to all go out to a newsstand near you and buy the- uh, I'm copy. lucky, I have the paper version. Thank yeah, you yeah, for yeah, sending yeah. it to me. It just arrived today, so I'm, yeah. I'm current. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have our own little, you know, stagecoach uh, that goes around delivering. Sometimes they're late, but sometimes they're not. Uh, Santa. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, I don't know about the time frame wh where think, we're at. I, I think it's, it's time to say. Okay, well, I have time for one more question, if that's. Okay, well then. Uh, let's say this. Uh, well, this goes full circle to what we were talking about before. Uh, this is okay. Kimber from Cowboys and Indians magazine. Uh, we can all use tips right now for easing stress and anxiety in life. Mm. What is something that has always worked for you? Well, what has worked for me has changed over time. And I think we've had so much time with this experience, this global pandemic and, and, and a lot of isolation uh, that different modalities are welcomed and different days require different things. So uh, I know people, a lot of times people will say meditation, sometimes that goes hand in hand with, you know, prayer for people who have some modicum of, you know, whatever their faith may be. And, and sometimes that's a bit dented, you know, we get a little bummed out about things and get frightened of the future because it's, it's so different and uncertain and we want to find our way out. But so I, I think just taking things on a daily basis um, and, you know, breathing, gosh, it's hard for me because I'm a little excited and tense about having done this with you today. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm watching myself just kind of hold my breath a little bit. And so there's this one breath that a yoga teacher taught me and it's very helpful that um, is common knowledge if you seek it out online, I'm sure, but it's to time the inhale so that it lasts five counts or four but to slowly allow the exhale to be through the breath and take twice as long as the inhale or like five to eight counts or something. And you can regulate your stress and getting it to in, to, to, I can regulate my stress and get to get out of being too much in my head and more in my body and my body knows when it's safe and, and the breathing tells the body that it's safe. So, like five, in, five counts on the inhale and eight on the exhale seems to be the trick and do that for a few minutes. And there's another thing that's a good trick is to tap one side of your body at a time. Uh, I know it sounds strange, but the body has a lot of wisdom in it that we think we know everything, but the body, you know, I'm an actor, so I'm allowed to know stuff like that. But um, there's so much information available and it's a wonderful time to increase our individual healing, whether that's starting oh. therapy when you didn't have a therapist before or reading cool books that i mean I, I know many people who said gee i really wish i had more time to read like, well here you go yeah <laughs> you or to watch some great old movies like True. uh uh, uh catalanian little britches <laughs> for example <laughs> running around at 14 my hair i could sit on it it was so long back then oh yeah. uh, i can remember having hair it was <laughs> You have a great hat. So you're yeah, welcome. I think I think it was during the Carter administration. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Diane, it's been a pleasure. And been great talking with you. I've Thank really you, enjoyed, Joe. you know, not only having these words, but also getting a chance to get the word out there about a really striking movie. I'm uh, proud of it. It's let, a nice feeling to have. So thank you. Uh, yes, you have every right to be proud, and it will be hitting theaters. Knock wood. Uh, on in early November, uh, Focus Features release. Thanks for the words. Thank you, Joe. Have a great day and enjoy the, the article, y'all.
<laughs> I lived in Georgia. I can say that. There you go. There All you right. Go. Thank you. Bye Thank now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.